Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been quite an endeavor traveling all the way from India, coming over here and presenting my work to all of you and definitely looking forward for a lot of feedback. I myself have a lot of questions, but still I'm looking forward for questions from all of you. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Liv for the last comment that we that she gave in, at the plenary session about myth and archaeology and that was really interesting a thought for me. Uh, presentations till now have discussed a lot of archaeological objects and concepts behind it and I thank all of the presenters because they have really created a very good uh, foundation for what I want to talk about. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is just an introductory slide because I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the Indian archaeology, what happens in that part of the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about ob uh, archaeological objects from Indus or Harappan civilization. The, the civilization or culture is identified interchangeably by both these terms. Uh, the sites are mainly divided into India in India and Pakistan across the border. Uh, just to give you names of major sites, uh, you all probably know Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. There are a few more in India which have been extensively excavated like Dhulavira which is in Greater Run of Kutch and Lothal which is identified as a port site. Uh, and quite a probably hundreds of sites more. Uh, just to give you a brief background about what period I am talking about. So, uh, in Indian archaeology, this period is considered as proto-history, something lying between prehistory and history because we have something which looks like a text but we are not able to read or decipher. So, this has been identified as a proto-history period which lies somewhere between uh, 3000 uh, BC to uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1500 uh, BC and it has been having its own phases of early, mature, late periods of urbanization. Uh, just, uh, just to give you a brief background of when this uh, culture was first excavated, uh, first identified and excavated uh, in 1920s by British archaeologists and uh, the objects which you can see on top right are <coughs> the objects which I am going to talk about. These have been identified as seals right from the day where they were first found in the sites. Uh, just to give you a few interesting facts about these objects, uh, I do not have references at the end of my presentations because the references would take another presentation. <laughs> so, uh, the list of references just about the scripts, not the object, goes on like 200 plus A4 pages. There have been 40 plus decipherments of the script but there, has, there is no consensus and 40 plus number is based on a publication that happened by fossil or again like maybe 15 years ago. So from then there have been quite some. Uh, if you see the uh, distribution of objects, you can see it's biased with only two sides just because of the extensive excavations which have happened in these two sides. Uh, and number of encoded signs, so the script, the decipherment efforts have happened where people have tried to encode these signs uh, just to give you an analogy like English alphabets. So people, some scholars feel there are like only 20 uh, core signs and the other signs are modifications whereas some feel there are like 700 plus or minus uh, <laughs> signs. So you can see the amount of work that has gone in people have spent lifetimes in doing it, have produced uh, volumes on it. Uh, just an overview and while I was going through, I was listening to the other presentations before me, even it was interesting to understand what is the power of the artifact, what is it actually giving that power to that artifact, whether it's a context, whether it's a material, whether it's our interpretative framework of these objects, whether it's rarity and then when I'm trying to apply these to the objects that I'm looking at. I am probably not able to apply any and probably think of it as it is probably our lack of understanding because these are not really rare if you looked at the 
number of objects so then uh, what is happening with these uh, objects which have no particular uh, uh, expression of power or reason the for everybody just to get familiar with what the object means and what is the popular nomenclature in the uh, harappan uh, script studies so the top signs which you see is popularly known as script uh, i am particularly not calling it as a script because script in means that it it is a language behind it so i am particularly trying to call it as sign across my presentation uh, you can see some pictures over there that primary icon the picture that you see here is popularly known as unicorn in this context uh it has nothing to do with what you may know in britain so <laughs> it's many people think that it's probably a mythical animal or maybe a bull seen in profile with just one uh, horn see uh at the back you can see a boss and at some sometimes with a small perforation or sometimes nothing at the back this is i would i won't call this as a representative object because there are numerous variations in this object which you will see uh, with the presentation <coughs> uh i just wanted to clarify with this and the next uh, slide that i'm not the first one to do any of these studies people have done quite a lot of studies and here is just a chart showing number of signs being encoded by different people uh from 1930s till like few years back uh now what has happened is when these objects are being studied for uh, ultimately the aim of many of these scholars or rather majority of these scholars is deciphering the script because unless we read what these objects are trying to tell we are not able to understand anything more about the objects there have been lot of archaeological studies obviously but because we cannot read there is no context to it and then uh, none of these can be uh, uh, you know related with the historic texts which are there in the continent so now what has happened is these texts are itself being studied as artifact and when you look at them in isolation from the subject these are the kind of studies which have happened on the script so you can look at sign positions sign frequencies patterns pairs triplets and things like that and uh, as you can see all this research has happened with one uh, presumption behind it that the signs have a language encoded into it and then at some <coughs> some of the scholars actually believe that they actually uh, encode dravidian language dravidian is the south indian uh, language group uh in fact even trying to identify synonyms for the jar shaped or fish shaped objects in the dravidian languages and trying to extrapolate and interpret these signs but then as you could see the number of signs themselves vary there are no consensus to it now here are just few examples of what kind of research people have been doing with these sign frequencies so you can see most popular <coughs> pair most popular triplet most popular four sign combinations uh just to remind you that these these the statistics has been run on all such scripts taken out from all the objects which are like four, which range between 4000 to 5000 uh number here is one more example uh i just given small references at the bottom who have done these studies most frequent signs which occur at the first uh initial stage later stage so you can see that all these efforts are in the uh, direction of identifying the language or knowing that the language is encoded one more this is one of the few examples where the scholar has actually tried to relate the not necessarily the script but the objects with its context in a way at a very broad level which is the object type and sites if anybody is interested let me know i can share these uh, papers later because there is too much on the slide to explain and read i can understand uh one more example of positional frequencies this has happened on 
different type of different database. So just to tell you that this and the previous slide research has happened on a database which says that in the script has 417 signs. Whereas if you see this one, it is done on a database which says in the signs are 695 in total. So you can see that there is no way to cross verify a lot of different work that is happening. Now, despite all this, there are some common consensus that at, without any uh, sufficient evidence probably to it, that it, the signs do indicate language. Uh, my question is how frequency and patterns can always indicate a language. We ourselves use a lot of uh, uh, material <coughs> in our day to day life, which does have patterns, but do not necessarily indicate a language. I will show some examples at the end maybe. Direction of writing, there are a lot of uh, 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 hypoth hypothesis behind the, what the direction of writing is. Uh, and other sites, what you can see is, except for like six or seven major sites, rest of rest hundreds of sites coming from different geographies and different time periods are clubbed into one as other sites. So even if there is any uh, variability within those objects, it is all made, it is all masked with just one tag to it. So we will not be able to see anything more in that particular category. Uh, this is one example where the uh, person has actually tried to relate these objects to its archaeological context. Mind you, these this map comes from 1930s excavation. So the excavation techniques and uh, uh, ways to identify stratigraphy were quite different and there have been people who have raised serious concerns <coughs> over understanding of stratigraphy. But still this effort was done. But just to remind you that this particular research does not include the science. It just talks about some types of objects. So again, there is a gap. And then you have other group of scholars who have their own hypothesis telling that this is this cannot be a language and they have challenged it probably uh, 15 years ago that uh, anyone who finds an object with 50 or plus signs uh, deserves an award. And they do have their own uh, 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 theories behind it, why this cannot happen. It's quite an interesting paper to read actually. Uh, so the theoretical problem in their study is probably they are treating lack of evidence as evidence because they are comparing Indus civilization with lot of other parallel civilizations and whatever material we find in those civilizations which have script and language like writing material or anything or long scripts all those are absent in Indus civilization and that is why you these uh, scripts do not show a language but then it's a it's an absence so we cannot take it as a evidence so uh, we are so in this whole thing we actually realize that we are looking at these scripts only as the artifact what if we actually realize and uh, go back and realize that the scripts are actually appearing on an object and the object itself is trying to convey some meaning to us along with all of its properties. So when we look at the object, these are probably the properties. There could be more, but to begin with at least basic, like size, shape, its context, uh, find spots, number of sites, whether the object is inscribed or not in the first place and many such. And uh, I have just picked a very small list of research here on the column and those are the aspects or data sets which people have been using. All the green boxes that you see are the gaps which are which exist currently when you are trying to study <coughs> these objects as archaeological objects. So you, if you see sign analysis, everybody is doing sign analysis but none of them are doing spatial analysis, temporal analysis or even looking at the artifact properties like what material they have or uh, what form and shape they have etc. So I'm trying to see if we, any of these gaps can be filled and then if we can 
have some more insight into purpose of these objects. Oops, sorry. Okay, so actually now is the part where I'm trying to do some work, but I've got probably only five minutes left, but I'll <laughs> just skip through most of it. So uh, those are the slides that I have. These are the objects without signs. So these are definitely the objects which are probably conveying a very different meaning than those which have a script. Here is one example where you can see a unicorn, but the, it's broken. So the signs, if at all they exist, exist they are not there. Interestingly, all those signs that you see there, none of them ever occur along with the signs. Uh, when you try to <coughs> do some basic analysis with the sizes of these objects, because uh, they differ, the sizes range from like 2 centimeter to 5 centimeter in square. And interestingly, this information has been available in the photographic corpus of these objects. But there are no studies which have actually used this information along with other attributes or signs. Uh, these are the material varieties that we often get. But majority of these objects have been uh, created in steatite or quite a few in copper. But they are from a particular site only. But then we do have a variety of material and if we actually look at material and sites, there could be some interesting uh, observations about the pictures that we actually see on these seals. The three pictures that I have picked are relatively layered, uh, rare. The, on the first slide, the unicorn that you saw is the most common one that you find, whereas these are the rare ones. But when we try to see the rare varieties across the sites, there is some pattern. Of course, a lot more needs to be done over here. It's just the beginning of when I'm trying to uh, dive deep into these objects. Uh, and now there is a possibility to actually contextualize this, even if there are issues with the stratigraphy. But uh, this is a, a small picture from the excav or actual excavation report published in 1937. And this is an entry in the database to which I'm referring to. That's the actual object. So if we actually look at the object, it's almost broken and we cannot see it in entirety. When we actually try to locate it, it's somewhere there. And these uh, plans have been published for all the three or four uh, cultural phases which were identified by the then archaeologists. So here we are when we are actually looking at signs as artifacts and then signs as attributes of a object. Uh, so we have actually seen that the attribute has overtaken the art, actual artifact and that is where probably there is nothing more happening in that research. Uh, and it, we could also see that it's impossible to cross validate the research that is happening. Uh, so what can be done hereafter is probably look at those green boxes, gaps and see if any other attributes of these objects can be used. And this is the example. So probably we are looking at something like this when we are looking at in the subjects, though they all look probably superficially same. But now today we have a, the, this is the last slide. So just probably one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do have richness of material today. I mean, plastic, paper, metal. So uh, irrespective of that, we do see now these are two uh, patterns which don't look similar at all but both are the car number plates one with the north arrow is actually indicator of it belonging to a military or a defense establishment in india and this one belongs to like delhi number 12 whereas if you can see this and this or something else you do have different signs and symbol on it but then you have same uh, number uh, same pattern like four numbers in four groups and things like that so yeah maybe we are looking at something like this and thinking that everything looks the same and finding out the patterns thank you so much